Heart Beat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska is made possible by Kupik Carlisle Transportation, your full-service transportation and logistics company. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. One, two, three, four, let's go. It's Heartbeat. It's a fabulous show. Alaska. Hi, Heartbeat Alaska. It's Heartbeat. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. Hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for Genie's show. It's the alley the Indian and the Eskimo. It's the alley the Indian and the Eskimo. Welcome one, welcome all. Hello everyone and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska, Native News and Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Today we travel to interior Alaska, to a village I don't think we've ever covered before. It's Grayling, Alaska. Join me now as we travel to Grayling, home of Athabascans. Thanks, Jeannie. School just got out in the village of Grayling, and normally these streets would be alive with kids playing ball, running around, or just biking. But not today. Today the streets are strangely silent. That's because Grayling's youth are attending a cultural camp 50 miles upriver. In interior Alaska, nestled on the edge of the Yukon River, there is a small Athabascan community. In 1962, 25 families uprooted themselves from their home on the Anoko River and settled in the place that today is known as the Village of Grayling. Game today. Gabe Nikolai Sr. is the first chief of Grayling and was just a boy when he and his family moved to the village. Grayling is located on the Yukon. I think it's on the north bank. 20 miles above Anvik. Well, I was just a kid when we left, so actually, uh, I was uh, probably about 11 or 10. What I remember is not very, very much compared to what's today, you know, because uh, we didn't have no TV, didn't have no AVAC, no phones, no clinics. It's a sort of small community in Hogechuk East, we've talked to 120 people. Hannah Mullell has lived in the area since 1941. She recalls life in the old village of Holikachuk. Well, school was just starting in Holikachuk. It was Holikachuk. School was just starting. And there, was, there were not very many kids in school at that time. <coughs> and the school and the kids like my step boys, they go out trapping whenever they wanted to and they went to school when they came back. So they didn't go to no um, high school. But I think they went to seven, eighth grade. Their schooling was more trapping and hunting and living off the land. That's my growing up, it was just, we lived away from the village. We lived in camp. And so mom was always after us to 
do this and do that and everything. And I never learned village life until I got married. We, we like to go to the Wookiee Grayling because uh, the slough was getting too shallow and hard time to move back and forth fishing. That slough that we went came through, and by August, the water so low you could hardly go through it. A couple of times from fish camp, we had to go down to Anvik and Holy Cross and by Shagluk to come back by to Holigachuk because the water was so low. Because we had a big uh, inboard motor and then we had a big boat that we used to stay in camping. Then we had a big barge to haul all our fish and dogs and all our stuff from fish camp to Holigachuk. And in the fall time, about August, we had to go back before school, before school started. <coughs> so it was just always traveling. We, um, we fish on the Yukon, and every fall it gets shallow, and we're coming back through. We moved all the way out Yukon to fish, you know, all summer. From first part of June and July and August, we had to go back. Those councils, they were young. They were uh, elders in the village. But um, our accountants were young at that time. And they went out to Yukon and they looked along where to make a village. And they picked Grayling for some reason. I don't know. They just picked Grayling and that was a good spot they picked. There's been an old village there in Grayling. So it actually the most likely site for a new village, I guess, because it had creek ridges, water, everything, gravel beach. Or just ideal location. Grayling may not be a bustling metropolis, but it does have the amenities that many other Alaskan communities enjoy. There's approximately 200 people there. We have David Lewis Memorial High School and elementary, approximately 60 students. We have a native store, post office, a clinic, a new brand new clinic that's been done gas station, HYL fuel. Then, you know, it's growing up pretty good here, you know, because you see it, we've got a new clinic coming on back there. And uh, we've got a fairly new gym over there, and we've got a new <clears throat> teen center coming up. Marvin Deacon is a wellness counselor supervisor for the Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation. Practically all of us uh, here in Grayling, you know, except for me, but I still do this, you know, we're we really depend on subsistence uh, living, and we're all waiting for the kings to come in now so we can put that up for the winter. And uh, after that, you know, we <clears throat> wait for the moose season, berry gathering, wood gathering. And for the people that don't uh, work or have jobs, you know, subsistence is a really big part of their lifestyle, you know, because uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you went down to our native store down there, but, uh, you know, but I can say that, you know, the prices are real high if you're going to buy a piece of, uh, beef or pork, you know. What kind of fish is it? Because subsistence plays such an important role in everyday life, the village of Grayling started organizing a culture camp. The camp was designed to teach the youth of Grayling about subsistence living and the way life used to be. <laughs> about 25 youth loaded into the skiffs and traveled the 30 miles up to the spot chosen for the campsite. <laughs> Once everything was lugged ashore, it was time to set up camp. Watch where you throw it. There was brush to clear, a fire to make, and tents to be set up. Well, we're enjoying ourselves. First of all, we got all the young people out here. We're having a culture camp. We're bringing them back to their roots, I hopefully. Learn more about some native yeah. lifestyle. After the camp was all set up, there was plenty of free time for fishing, playing in the woods, and carving. Well, you, you notice we've been eating a lot of fish, you know, as part of our roots is uh, eating fish in the springtime.
Hey, look. Hey, look. Oh, I'm an empty wine. What's your name? After a nice warm meal, the youth spent a few minutes together sharing with one another their feelings on the day's events. <laughs> this first time we had this younger group like us, and I enjoy it. It's hard, harder to keep track of them, but you know, we got we got enough chaperones where everybody's kind of like monitoring every little group, and so we're, we're trying to keep track of them really good, so we want nothing to happen. We're having fun anyway. It's just a learning experience. As the first day drew to a close, everyone agreed that they were having a great time and were looking forward to tomorrow. I'm enjoying it so much and be, being here. I'd say my people, and I, I just enjoyed it. It's an ideal situation to be in. Day two. After a hearty breakfast, it was time to pile into the skiffs once again, this time for fishing. On the way back to camp, we made a brief stop to collect some birch bark. The bark is used by the villagers for making crafts and maybe a few other things. They make birch, birch bark baskets out of it, but I'm just using it for my smokehouse. <laughs> Later that afternoon, the group traveled three miles upriver to the old site of Halikachuk. The youth got a brief look around the village that their elders grew up in. Just across the river from the village lies Halikachuk Cemetery. The afternoon was spent paying respect to elders long gone and restoring the cemetery. A large cross was erected to honor those who have passed. That evening, back at camp, Hannah Malel shared with the youth some vocabulary words spoken by their elders. So. When I went home, our mom, she talked only Indian language. I don't understand her. And so I learned how to talk my native language again. Because mom, that's all she talked was native language. Teaching the youth their native tongue and showing them the places and ways their ancestors lived is all designed to encourage wellness. We're, we're trying to you know, promotes wellness amongst all our younger people, and it helps a lot by bringing them out here in the woods. Okay. Well, you're out here in the woods, and I'd say wellness is, you know, just being out here, it's, it's, it's a nice experience being away from town. You don't have to watch TV and listen to dogs howl, and you're, you're kind of like self-sufficient here. You're cooking. You're not going to any stores or anything. Uh, we, we, got, we got some some stuff from the stores, but we're not eating them yet. We're, we're kind of like holding them off till we <laughs> get tired of fish, I guess. A wellness uh, a program like that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really good. You know, it shows the uh, <clears throat> young kids, you know, what, uh, what they can learn from the elders. Also, uh, what uh, our leaders can do, you know, in, in positive ways. You know, like we need uh, good role models. And our leaders got to be uh, <clears throat> good role models for our, our kids, you know, show them positive things. I got I to gotta, I gotta say this on behalf of wellness. We're using our wellness funds to come out here. And one of the things on wellness is... Uh, I think it's our inner being is being happy, and that's why we want to be here today. So, um, in the next couple of days, so everybody try to enjoy yourself and be happy, and don't argue or nothing. Just enjoy yourself the way you're doing now, and uh, that's what wellness is about. Well, taking them out like this, I think they learn something. 
like um, when people are talking, when somebody comes in and talk to them, I think it helps them. And they don't, uh, kids don't remember one, just talking to them one time. They have to hear it over and over. Have you seen any young men around here? They're taking that tent down right there. With the camp winding down, some of the youth shared with us their favorite parts of the experience. Just cleaning out the graveyards, checking out how we could chop, fishing. Fishing. Probably fishing. Making ice cream over there, carving stuff over there, fishing. So was this year's culture camp a success? We'll let the youth describe what they thought of it. It was pretty cool. Having fun. Sounds pretty good. good. Cool. <laughs> I would say that's a yes. <laughs> Three village that don't uh, hold or have a culture camp, I really uh, encourage you to have a culture camp culture camp, you know, just get together with your council or, uh, you know, your tribal leaders, elders, and you can uh, solicit money from your local organizations, you know, like your, your co native corporations or, you know, the store or just have raffles or, you know, whatever to raise money. And it does, it does work, shows the kids positive things and, uh, the kids use you. The, every Wednesday I wanted, the kids to want to come home, you know. They like it out there. In Grayling, Alaska, on the banks of the Yukon River, I'm Andy Dwyer for Heartbeat Alaska. Thank you so much, Tanana Chiefs. Thank you, Perry Asogiak, for sponsoring this program on wellness, on preserving our culture, and the good people of Grayling, Alaska. Now we travel a bit north to Nome, Alaska. Speaking of this time of year, tourists flock to this historical town. Located on the Seward Peninsula on the edge of the Bering Sea, Nome, Alaska is rich with history and is the finish line for the world famous Iditarod. Laura Samuelson, director of Nome's Museum, explains Nome's 24 karat genesis. In September 1898, three gentlemen called the Three Lucky Swedes, later known as the Three Lucky Swedes, their name was Jap at Lindeberg. Eric Lindblom and John Frenchison were prospecting for gold in this area, and they discovered gold at Anvil Creek on September 22, 1898. Well, there had been a gold rush in the Klondike that same year, actually in 1997 and 98, and it had petered out. And so that was just up the Yukon River, up from St. Michael, and those people found out about the gold discovery at Nome, and they came down that, that winter, about 5,000 of them, and settled in this area. As luck would have it, one of the soldiers who was trying to keep peace in Nome at the time ran his hand through the sand on the beach at Nome and discovered gold. There was gold in the sand, and that was unbelievable. That meant easy pickings for people, and that's why it eventually became known as the poor man's paradise. So the news of that went south in, eight, in the fall of 1899, and over the winter, that brought up a lot of interest from people and in the summer of 1900 was the, the um, Nome became the site of the largest gold rush in Alaska. 40,000 people were here just like that searching for gold. Every year 23,000 tourists from all over the world flock to Nome. Director of the Nome Convention and Visitors Bureau Josie Stiles explains just what Nome has to offer its visitors. Nome is a town of 3,500 people. Um, we have a lot of community-oriented activities. Um, the community really comes together to host visitors from around the world. We have Iditarod, of course. We have the Midnight Sun Festival. We have um, our history, which is a 106-year-old gold rush history. Um, we have 300, over 300 miles of road. We have uh, cruise ships that come in. We have the Iron Dog uh, 
snow machine race that comes through here. We have pet reindeers. Uh, we have facilities and accommodations for meetings and conventions. Um, we have it all. <laughs> now, if I was a champion at this, the measured amount of dirt, the measured amount of gold, I would be done in 11 seconds. Hank Ireland is a tour manager for Gnome Tour and Marketing. He has given gold panning and historical tours to people from all points of the globe. Well, the people have been doing good. You see all the red sand here. Red sand and black sand. That's what they'll find down on the beach. But that shows where the gold is. Our tourists come from all over the world. Um, we've had um, all kinds of, uh, we have Germans, Scandinavians, people from Switzerland. We had folks this morning from Australia. We've had a large Australian contingent. The uh, Gosh, where else? We've had them from Brazil. Taiwanese used to be a major component of our uh, of our tourism. They, they, that has slacked off in the last couple of years, but we've been picking up people from Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, other places in the south uh, southeast or southwest Asia. Nome has several major events that draw tourists to the community each year. Well, we have two things that really are bringing people to Nome in the summertime: the history uh, of Nome, which is what we really cover. And then the other thing is the birding, the birds that we have, the 170 some species of birds from all over the world. I forgot to mention that we have birds. We have um, the Eurasian migration that comes through here. So people come from all over the world to see what they call life birds. And those are birds that they will only see once in their lifetime. And um, they, the birds come here and the birders come here and this year we have quite quite a bit more and the city of Nome and the Nome Convention and Visitors Bureau are working with uh, business owners to try and enhance that industry locally here so we can benefit from that. The bird watchers of course come for all the birds um, that we get that migrate in here and that's a big population. Then the next is the package tourist and they most of them 99.9% .9 spend time in Kotzebue and in Nome. So they come on this tour to do the native culture and then the gold mining experience. And they do the native culture in Kotzebue and then the gold mining here in Nome. Mary Canodal is the owner operator of Nome's Arctic Trading Post. And then the next one would be the Iditarod people and they come in March. The cruise ship people I think are both a combination of the birders um, they, and the regular package tour. They come for the native, the um, gold mining, and also for bird watching and animals and uh, the flora and the fauna in the area. The tourist season starts in Nome about the 15th of May uh, with the first bird watchers that come to town and then goes through middle of September. And that's our main tourist season. And then we have them again in March for I Did Rod. Whatever time of year, Nome has plenty to keep its visitors happy. And to this town, it seems, tourism is as good as gold. Nome, Alaska. The old stomping grounds of my dad, Eugene Blatchford. He was born in Teller. I've got an awful lot of relatives up that way, and hello to every single one of you. Join me again next week, won't you, for more Heartbeat Alaska, and maybe we'll visit your village. God bless every single one of you. I'll see you again next week. To purchase a copy of this program, have your credit card ready and call area code 907-563-7440 or send check or money order to Jeannie Green Productions, 6250 Tuttle Place, number 5, Anchorage, Alaska, 99507. Ask for the program number listed below.